Hi everyone, and thank you for having me here remotely at Game SoundCon. Uh, welcome to building audio plugins for Unreal Engine 5. Um, I'm Jay Steen, I'm the tech director at Swedish Tech, and I'm going to talk through how we build our audio plugins for UE5. Uh, I'm going to talk through the how, the why, and then a bit of the what. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I would have really liked to be, and I, hopefully I'll be able to make it next year to see you all in person and meet you all and have a bit of a party as well. Because that's, you know, part of the fun of conferences, isn't it? So, um, first an outline of the session. Uh, I'll talk about what Swedish Tech is and what we do for context. Um, I'll run through what UE5 provides for extending its functionality and which of those parts we make use of. I'll give a case study into our publicly released plugin Audio Inspector. And I'll talk a bit about something we have in development that uses even more of the engine's extensibility features than Audio Inspector. Um, some takeaways I'd like people to get from this talk are how and why you might want to extend UE5 audio, the specifics of building audio tools, the context we build ours in, and the lessons we learned from it. And finally, some inspiration. We all thrive when there's a healthy community building amazing things around UE5 audio, so hopefully this seeds some ideas for uh, different approaches that people can take. So on to Swedish Tech itself. We're part of the Sweet Justice Sound Group, um, making interactive audio technology for video games and interactive experiences. We're focusing on Unreal Engine 5, as it is, in our opinion, um, emerging as an industry standard audio system, um, and that's partly due to its focus on meta sounds and also partly because of its extensibility. Um, we're, for this, we're building boutique audio middleware uh, that works modularly, so each plugin can stand alone or interoperate with others in our range. OK, so first up, I'm going to talk a bit about extending Unreal Engine 5 from an audio perspective. Um, I'm going to go into the how to kick it off, and then a little bit of the why. So first, the how. There are a few different pieces of the puzzle that I want to go over with you. Um, there's uplugins, modules, and APIs. U plugins are the things that you see when you look on the marketplace at like code plugins and such. And when you open the plugins menu inside Unreal Editor, you get a list of them. They represent a self-contained feature or set of features that can be dropped into projects on compatible versions of the engine. It makes sharing easier and keeps things nicely logically separated for you. Um, so they can have dependencies on parts of the engine or other U plugins, which is pretty cool if you want to be able to reuse your code or blueprints or any kind of data, actually. It can all be done with U plugins. <clears throat> And a U plugin can contain one or more modules. So these are code things. They're units of related code that are compiled as one thing and then can be loaded by the editor or the game. And this is depending on what they do. Um, they make sure you don't end up shipping editor-only code in your final game. They also help you not to make a big mess of your data type definitions and your dependencies, which is great. Um, so. As I said, with dependencies, you can make a module depend on another one, and this helps you to structure your work and make sure you only use what you need. And then there are API extension points. So for those that aren't aware, API is short for Application Programming Interface. Um, I'm including anything here that lets you interact with and affect what the engine does, which includes base classes for blueprints, um, code functions, and classes that are usable in plugins and game modules, and also blueprint functions and operations. The audio engine and the editor provide a lot of very useful extension points for coders and for Blueprint scripters as well, which allow functionality to be built from them. And um, you can time this um, overriding uh, and functionality by how the game engine works. Um, but more on that in a sec. So I'll start with public API functions. So these allow you to call into the engine and change its default behavior or affect what it's doing uh, at any time that suits you or any time you can. A good example of this is um, we often we often use uh, setting source effect chains on um, active sounds, and you can also manually set submixes. We're doing this in some cases as well. Then there are delegates. So these allow you to handle events that are triggered by the engine just in time as they happen. So doing this lets you kind of append extra behavior uh, to things that the engine does and to do it in a timely fashion. So rather than having to wait or um, polling state to find out when things have changed, you can do it at the moment that it happens. 
audio subsystems are a particularly hidden gem of extensibility for the audio engine. Um, they let you create your entire subsystem uh, and have it ticked at the same rate and on the same thread as the audio device, which then allows you to interact um, synchronously from code with the audio device without having to queue commands off of the game thread. This is really useful, and we use this for any of our plugins that have runtime components, as they let you design systems in a more data-oriented way. For example, an ambient system that could manage sound priorities um, from a system like this, it can do it on the audio thread and it can interact with the sounds directly as it does so. Editor windows are the way that Unreal allows you to create workflows with custom UIs. They can be written directly in Slate C++ UI code or composed in editor utility blueprints using UMG widgets. It's really powerful and flexible to be able to break out of the pre-made editor workflows if your system needs extra UI, and I would argue that all systems would benefit from some custom editors and inspectors. And then of course there's Metasounds. Uh, what more can I say? Take a bow, um, Unreal Audio team. They let you create new nodes for placing in your patches, which uh, you can use to create new DSP effects or utility nodes to make your Metasound life easier. Um, but lesser known, perhaps, is that you can create new interface types. So an interface is the, the for example, the one-shot interface, which sends an event um, when the patch starts, or the, attenu uh, or the attenuation interface that sends float values about uh, distancing. So we, can, we, we actually use custom interfaces to send specific pre-formatted data to Metasounds. For example, in the Metasound MIDI plugin, uh, we pipe MIDI data directly to the preview Metasound using a custom interface that you can add to your Metasounds and then do things with, like trigger samples. So given that you can, why would you want to extend UE5 Audio? So the biggest thing for me is that UE5 Audio is unopinionated, um, at least in my opinion. Uh, at least it's unopinionated on how you should make audio for your game. It provides the building blocks, but not highly specialized systems. So to get the best from it, you will have to extend the engine somewhat um, for your game. So extending the engine allows you to share your work between projects, either within your team if you have uh, multiple projects, or to future projects if you're a one project team. Um, of course, it makes, uh, it makes it much easier for teams like Swedish Tech to build things too, and um, have them uh, in multiple teams and projects. It also helps you to build things in a clearer, more structured way than if it was kept within just the game target module or somehow um, placed in the engine. And having these things also helps with iteration times for coders, as building and linking code is much faster if things are packaged off into plugins like this. So next, I'm going to go through a case study uh, in the Audio Inspector, which is Swedish Tech's publicly released plugin on the marketplace. It's free if you search for it and type Audio Inspector or Swedish Tech, you can download it for free now and use it to help you debug your sounds. So let's look at how it's structured. It's all self-contained in a plugin, which takes advantage of UE5's plugin architecture. It depends on audio modules as well as Slate for UI stuff. It has one editor module inside that plugin, which registers all the windows and styles that it uses with the engine on startup. It also handles live coding events to uh, enable faster iteration. So let's drill into it a little more. When you open the audio inspector through the menu window, the module creates an S dock tab, which allows you to dock the audio inspector anywhere in the editor layout, which is great because everyone has their own preferences for where things should be put. Inside that S doc tab is an instance of S Swedish Active Sounds widget, which is where all the magic happens. The main widgets here that do all the work are S search box and S list view. So you can kind of see what this looks like if you look at the audio inspector. You can see the search box at the top, and the list view is just what shows all of the information. Um, I've included some code here as an example because I'm a coder and I like to see it um, in talks. So. This is a little taste of the declarative syntax that you use to um, to build Slate UI in UE5, C++. Uh, this is the code that determines the layout of the audio inspector. It's quite concise and allows you to define things in line or indeed elsewhere if it's getting too verbose. I kind of like it. Um, I like the way it's structured and the way it uh, 
you can grow it as you need to. And using it, we can turn an unassuming S list view into a table view using a combination of a couple of things. An S header row with the columns defined, um, as in this code snippet, and a row widget that inherits from S multi column table row. And then the row widget gets a callback to create a widget for each cell individually. So you can do custom logic per column here when a row gets created. This is what allows us to handle double clicks differently, depending on whether the user is clicking on the sound assets name or the attenuation asset or sound class, or also allows us to color the volume um, cells differently. So I also experimented uh, in how to draw this window. So I experimented with caching state inside the widget and using events to provide data to the active sounds widget. But in the end, the state was changing almost wholesale every frame, so I opted for a polling approach. Um, every tick, it reads all active sounds from the audio device and rebuilds the list. This kind of has the downside of not allowing the user to highlight a row as it will be removed and rebuilt the next frame. But this was not as important as getting the feature running quickly when we built it. So it updates using an active timer uh, with a tick interval that you can set in the settings menu. So if you want to slow down the refresh, you can trade calmness for accuracy. And here's a video of me changing the update interval just to show you what it means. So you can see it's updating as fast as it can now, no interval. And you can see it's pretty jittery, but you are getting all the information that you ask for there. Whoa. Now I'm gonna reset the interval to 0.5 seconds, so half a second between each update. And you can see it's not quite spamming so much. You might miss a very quick sound or the start of a sound, but in the end, you will probably see everything that's going on. So I wanted to make the best use of live coding I could in order to increase iteration speed because live coding is absolute gold for programmer productivity. However, Slate doesn't really support auto refresh because its layouts are constructed up front and remain in memory. I mean, this is a good thing. I wouldn't want the whole editor rebuilding itself every time that I made a code change. I wanted to be able to opt in. So the module subscribes to the reload complete delegate and recreates the audio inspector when that happens. This isn't ideal because it listens to all the reload events raised, even if they're from different modules. Um, this is something we need to work on for the future. Um, and I actually think that in the most recent version of the engine, there's a, a more specific delegate to live coding that's been introduced. So I need to update to that. Um, here's a slightly contrived example of me changing the fractional digits on the distance column in code and, um, and then blink and you'll miss the hot reload of the slate window, which is exactly how I wanted it. So you can see now there's two decimal places on the distance column. We're gonna to switch to the code and comment out the constant and use a cheeky magic number. And there's the live coding event happening. We're gonna switch back and watch the distance decimal places snap back to four. There we go. So this helped to iterate the audio inspector quickly and I would thoroughly recommend it because being able to make these changes quickly and as quickly as possible um, will help you get to a better set of tools. So what did we learn from the audio inspector? The first big thing that we learned was how to make a widget in a window in a plugin that did things for people that was useful. Um, this was good, it's a good direction to go in and we wanted to keep following that direction. We also learned that searching, filtering and sorting things in, in the inspectors that we're building is absolutely crucial. It's not a nice to have thing, like you have so much information, you just need to be able to filter it and filter down into what you need. We also had some things we knew we needed to improve. Like we learned that storing UI state inside the widget code itself is not a good idea and it makes life a bit harder for developers to iterate on and also to be more flexible with your UIs that you build. Um, I'm gonna to touch on that in a moment very briefly. We also learned that we really wanted to be able to cache game and editor state and not rebuild our UI data every frame as there is a lot of benefit to being able to select table rows for workflows. Like for example, if you want to um, watch the relative loudness of something to other things and watch it move up and down the rows. We want to be able to do that. So We took all those learnings forward into our new in-development plugin. 
um, that is for dynamic mixing. So I'm going to talk in on some very high level details about this um, because we're not quite ready to announce it yet. But I really wanted to share it with you because we're very excited about it. And um, yeah. So as an overview, we needed to be able to do automatic dynamic space mixing of sounds against each other. Um, and we needed to be able to do this alongside regular mixing techniques such as static or snapshot mixing. This kind of mixing is difficult to control without a clear view of what's happening in the system. The tools needed to expose pretty succinctly what is happening and allow users to get a visual overview or drill down into the details as they require. So the requirements for the tool UI of this plugin are pretty similar to audio inspectors. However, this time the system has a runtime component that Swedish Tech is developing. So we needed to make sure that that component surfaces data in the right way to the UI. Also this time, the plugin needs to establish data in the content database. So we wanted sound designers to be able to do this from within the workflow so they don't break flow when they want to make a change or lots of quick changes together. So this can often happen, as you all know, when you need to mix lots of sounds at the same time against one another. It also means we had to make allowances in editor code for supporting undo and redo using the transaction system. So as for the elements of the plugin, how we built it, we can basically break it down into three main elements. Firstly, there's a class that derives from audio subsystem, which is part of the runtime module. One of these gets created for every audio device that exists, and it's responsible for intercepting sounds that have dynamic mixing data authored for them just as they start. It then adds them to a pool to be processed and um, does the dynamic mixing across all of the sounds. It uses a combination of um, the uh, delegates and public APIs that I mentioned in the how section to do this. Next is a source effect, um, an instance of which is applied to each sound that is part of the dynamic mix. This is used uh, using the override API that I mentioned as well. It has a couple of responsibilities. It has to make sure the output of the sound is peak metered and the result is of this is, can be accessed by the subsystem. And its other responsibility is to ensure proper dynamic mixing attenuation is applied just to the sound that it's on. And finally, there's an editor component, which is absolutely crucial to being able to get the best out of this plugin. I'm going to go into more detail on how that is achieved now, as it's kind of the most accessible part of the plugin to talk about. It's also the most visual. And um, yeah, it's kind of doing, doing what it says it does. So that's going to be the way in which I'm going to talk about this plugin. But first, a demo, so you can see in practice what I'm talking about. So here we have a beautiful Venetian city scene with a rifle and a tank, because that suits our purposes. Um, so in order to get started with the Dynamic Mixing plugin, we have to open up some of the workflows. So there's a controls window, which we can just dock down here, and that has some system-wide controls. Uh, the attack of the system, the release of the system, the amount it is allowed to overshoot, a little bypass control that works when you are playing and a button to save values and settings. So in this plugin, we also have some settings windows that both work with the runtime and the editor. And you can set your controls up project wide for that. Um, then we have the authoring window. So this is how you start interacting with the plugin. And it shows you all of the USound base um, files that you have or assets that you have in the project and allows you to uh, set whether they are part of the system or not. So if we have a look at the M16 rifle, for example, and some explosions, I'm going to take them out of the system for now so that you um, can hear what it sounds like without it. And then I'm going to add them back in as we go. So we've got that, but we also want to be able to see what's playing. So we have an activity window, kind of like the audio inspector just for only for sounds that are playing within the system. And we've also got an envelope view. So this draws the uh, relative dynamics info that we need to see in a visual format. And it links in with the activity window in a way that I will show you soon. So right, we have everything we need. Uh, let's filter down. You can also see the filtering in action here. Like this lets you really quickly zero in on the just the asset that we want to edit and also just the controls we need to edit. It's not got anything that isn't relevant to the system in there. So without further ado, let's have a listen. 
So you can hear some music that's playing along with the system. There we go. It's pretty, pretty good mix, but I think we can make it more dynamic. So we're going to add this in, maybe give it just... Now let's, let's tweak its value. So, you can see now on the envelope, it's changing what's happening. And if we select it, it selects it in the activity window, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can see what's going on with particular sounds and then look at their distant, uh, different properties over here. So, you can hear the music. But what about explosions, I hear you say? Well, let's add these in as well. well. Maybe that's not quite loud enough. Let's go 118. Okay. We've added explosions. And if we pause, we can highlight all of the explosions and have a look at what they're doing to the system. Also, Oh, the grenade launcher fireworks too. So, that is the system in a nutshell. So this plugin is more complex than the audio inspector and has multiple aspects to its workflow. Broadly, we can split the workflow components down into authoring, activity, envelope, and controls, as I showed you. Um, trying to fit them all into one tab would involve too many compromises. Um, so we had two options. We could create a dashboard that contained everything and that allowed for limited customization but had a single point of entry. Or we could build the widgets completely separately and host them in their own tabs. We opted for the separate tabs approach so that users can completely customize their editor experience. They might want one view with just diagnostics on it or just the controls or authoring or everything as we've demonstrated. So. We had our design and all the necessary pieces to make these inspectors. Um, we also knew from experience with the audio inspector that having all the UI state and actions inside the widget code kind of limited us in what we could achieve. Um, this is a simplistic representation of the data flow within the audio inspector. It reads data from the audio device and just edits its own properties. So it's pretty simple but effective. But the dynamic mixing plugin is a bit more complex than that. So there are two parts, two main parts to the system to read and edit in the editors, and four views into that, as I've said. They have various intermediate data between them, and they need to be able to communicate with each other as well as the content database and the runtime system. So we needed something in the middle to facilitate all of these things. Um, to cut a long story short, we made use of a, con uh, of a concept called view models. Um, it's a bunch of theory that I don't really have time to cover today, but I did go over it at Unreal Fest. So if you want to check out that talk, um, and if you're interested, please do check it out. So that brings us to a close. Uh, send something to hello at Swedish Tech if you're interested and want to know more. So thank you so much, and hopefully we'll see you next year.